Aloha. Welcome to American Issues Take One. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host, and the title today for today's show is Michael Johnson. What kind of speaker of the house is that? Uh, we have a new speaker, uh, finally, on round, I believe it's round four. Uh, we've had a lot of candidates that came to the table and were all denied one way or another. Who are the candidates? It was Steve Scalise, Jim Jordan, uh, Tom Ells, and now Mike Johnson. Uh, in the show write-up, I said, you know, what was the uh, litmus test for you to become a speaker? And it appears Mike Johnson fills that test. Uh, the test is you have to be an election denier of the 2020 election. And if you weren't an election denier, then you would not be sitting as Speaker of the House. So um, we don't know a lot about Mike Johnson, but we do know he was uh, on the ground floor of the election denial for Donald Trump. So with that in mind, I'd like to introduce my co-host, Jay Fidel, and we're going to discuss this topic immediately. Good morning, Jay. Good morning, Jim. Uh, Jay, we don't know a lot about this guy. Um, Mike Johnson, he's a, re a representative from Louisiana. Steve Scalise seems to know a little bit about him because he was very complimentary in his introduction of, of my, uh, Mike Johnson. But we do know one thing, that he is an ally of Donald Trump. And he was very much connected with the early days of assisting Mr. Trump for the election denial that Joe Biden was the president and the, the election was stolen from Donald Trump. And he was on that ground floor. Um, I listened to his speech, his acceptance speech this morning, and um, he seems to be somewhat pragmatic as far as saying we have to get the business done for the American people. And the first thing he said was um, we have to fulfill our obligation to keep the government funded. That was certainly good news to my ears. Um, didn't sound like one of the bomb throwers of Marjorie Taylor Greene or, or the likes of her uh, or the uh, Matt Gates type that uh, let's just put a wrecking ball to government, get nothing done and watch it crumble. So uh, there was some, some hope in his initial words and uh, we'll see how this goes. Your thoughts. Hmm. I am no less concerned than I was before. He's a Trumper. Trumper is work, Trump is working behind the scenes, manipulating this whole process for the past month. Um, he, he, he was a Trumper uh, in denying the election. He, he voted against the electoral uh, ballots. Um, he was uh, actively supporting Trump in Trump's efforts to turn the election over, to turn the government over, to destroy our democracy. Uh, query, will he be better now? Answer, probably no. Um, I'm not confident at all. I think Trump speaks through him. Um, and we just don't know enough about him, but we will know more about him soon when we start to see what he has to say. I don't think he's his own man. I think he works for others. He works for Trump and he, and he works for the religious right. He's an extreme conservative. Um, I'm not happy at all with this. The Republicans do not have their act together. They do not represent the country. Uh, they got in in 2020, a lot of them. A lot of them. And uh, they were the product of all of the machinations that went on in that election. Uh, as I told you before the show, Tim, you know, we were all focused on Trump's efforts to steal the, the election from Biden and, uh, and January 6th and all that. And we forgot to look at exactly how Congress got constituted in the elections of 2020. Well, <clears throat> I, I think what happened is uh, Congress was also being manipulated by Trump. Uh, there were these, uh, you know, uh, uh, these efforts to uh, primary people, get his people to run on the Republican side. There were these efforts through social media to pour money into campaigns for Republican candidates, to uh, manipulate voting, suppress black voting, all the things that he was doing. Those things count. And uh, he said there would be a red wave. Well, OK, it may not have been a red wave, but it was enough to screw up Congress. And, and you, you know, walk through the halls of Congress and you see people who are clearly unqualified. And, and they are leading us. Where are they leading us? Where is Mike Johnson leading us? I will be really surprised if Mike Johnson leads us anywhere good. I think he's a proxy for Trump. OK. Let's take a step back just briefly on, on how we got to the selection of Mike Johnson. As you know, Steve Scalise was um, the next candidate, and um, that didn't take long for him to withdraw because clearly he saw the pathway to becoming the speaker 
was fraught with objections. Um, well, maybe let, me, let, me, let me let me just interrupt to say that <clears throat> he had a good chance until Trump uh, right. di dished him, and, and that was the end of him. It was immediate. As soon okay. as Trump turned against him, uh, he was gone. Well, that's where I was going with this. What is the common denominator? So then let's move to uh, Jim Jordan, who Donald Trump fully throated his endorsement, and he was the heir apparent. Uh, but for 20 um, Republicans, we did a show on this last week, uh, Jim Jordan was a bridge way too far, either from his um, involvement with um, the January 6th events that took place, uh, certainly with the election denial issues, and then he had a little bit of a, um, a some you know baggage from his days as assistant coach at the University of Michigan. Uh, that that tale never left, and so a lot of people thought that was a character flaw that this could they couldn't abide with. Uh, so Jim Jordan didn't make it, and Donald Trump that was a slap to his face because uh, remember Donald Trump is the kingmaker, correct? And uh, now Donald Trump's embarrassed. He's not the kingmaker because Jordan went down in flames. So then you had uh, Tom Ellis. And guess what? He was one that didn't decertify the election. Uh, he voted that the election was fair and clean. And so uh, within, within minutes, uh, Donald went to his true social network and typed in that um, um, Representative Ellis was a globalist rhino. And for those who don't know what rhino means, it means Republican in name only. That was the end of him. And lo and behold, now we have Mike Johnson. So Donald Trump now is again, because he's endorsed Mike Johnson, uh, he again comes off as the kingmaker, uh, the man with influence. Donald Trump, the leader of the GOP party and the MAGA party. Uh, Donald Trump, is he tarnished into this whole process or did he come up on, on top? Well, he's more tarnished than he ever was for me and for the people who are following the four indictments. Um, but for the Republican Party, which he had a lot to do with electing them as they are, um, he's not tarnished. He's in greater control, raising more money among the base, all that. And well, so I think it's tragic uh, that he's not, you know, out of control. I mean, uh, not no longer controlling. But I'm, I'm afraid to say the answer to your question is among the Republicans, he's in the same control or more. OK, well, let's look at the almost the last four weeks. Let's look at the last four weeks and say to the following, uh, the world's been watching and it's been a clown show. We've used that reference. It's been a clown show. To what degree does Donald Trump right. own the clown show and to how much damage has the House of Representatives sustained by not being able to elect a House speaker? Well, uh, you know, in the last four weeks, we have seen violence in the Middle East um, now on one, two, three fronts. And the newspaper today reported that there are attacks against Americans in Syria uh, and in Iraq, repeated attacks, dozens of attacks, and some American soldiers have been wounded. Um, so we have a we have a major problem going on uh, in in the um, in the Middle East. Uh, we have many problems going on in the Middle East. We have, of course, the problem in Ukraine. Uh, we have not supplied them with what they expected, what we promised, and Poland has just uh, turned over its F-16s to Ramstein, or said they would turn over their uh, F-16s, not to. Not to Ukraine, like they said they were going to do, um, but to the Americans in Ramstein. And this leaves everything in, in limbo because, um, because Biden has not yet agreed to give those F-16s or any F-16s to Ukraine, even though Ukraine is getting hammered. If you watch the news carefully these days, it does not look like Ukraine is winning. 20% or more of the land of Ukraine is occupied by the Russians. And they are more aggressive. They are using more weapons, more missiles, um, than and more, more, you know, dropping bombs on Ukraine than before. You you can't be heartened by what's happening in Ukraine, and they need help from us, you know, in a desperate fashion. Then you have, you know, the incident uh, or a series of incidents between Azerbaijan and Armenia and Turkey, another hotspot. 
and, and there are a lot of smaller hotspots, but right now the South China Sea is very hot. And China is being very aggressive with the Filipinos. Uh, and a lot of people think the reason is that it's winding up, it's softening the area up for its big play on Taiwan. And indeed, it is flying over and near Taiwan every day. Uh, it is having incidents in the Taiwan Strait. Um, and what we have is, again, a number of hotspots around the world, and we haven't paid attention to them. Worse than that, Tim, is that we have sent a message to everyone in the world, especially the autocrats, that we are weak and in political discord for a long period of time. So you can say that Mike Johnson is the solution uh, to that problem. I doubt it. Uh, and I think they are going to be looking very carefully at us to see whether that discord continues or whether we are a paper tiger. And I suggest they are going to find us a paper tiger and see the whole thing as opportunity, opportunity to continue their autocracy, to continue their violence, their invasions, um, you know, their, their violations of the liberal world order. Um, the world is in bad shape. And we have we've demonstrated we're not interested in fixing it. You know, uh, now Speaker Johnson said uh, at the podium in the House of Representatives uh, that one of his top priorities was also to ensure that there is sufficient funding for Israel. Uh, he was very silent on Ukraine and allegedly he is not a supporter of continued funding for Ukraine or certainly reduced funding for Ukraine. Um, by dividing the two, um, what message does that send? Well, it's, uh, I think it's a continuation of the reluctance of the Republican Party, uh, or a, a good number of them, um, to, to support Ukraine, which is really, really tragic, because Ukraine is the future of Europe. Uh, and what it does is it discourages the EU, it discourages NATO to see that the American government is not ardent at all. Uh, in defending Ukraine, that's that's so that's one thing. It's a continuation of the of the Trump policy. Remember, Trump is friendly. Uh, here's it's syllogistic. Trump is friendly with Putin. Uh, he's in a transactional arrangement with Putin. He wants to see Putin succeed. He's made it clear, and Putin, you know, wants to help Trump, like in the 2024, uh, like the social media and all that. So they got an arrangement. Those two guys. And I think that's playing out because Trump, the second part of the syllogism is Trump is controlling this guy. And I believe he's, you know, he controlled all these uh, failed elections in, over the past month. Um, but now I believe he's controlling Mike Johnson. And that's why Mike Johnson doesn't want to support Ukraine, because Trump doesn't want to support Ukraine. That's simple. Um, on Israel, it's a little different um, because Trump gets money from some Jewish factions. Uh, Trump believes he's got a good relationship with Netanyahu. After all, Netanyahu is like Trump in many ways. And all the problems in Israel over the past 10 months, um, you know, in my view, were, were, were a, an effect of that, an effect of the strange relationship between Trump and Netanyahu. And, and look where we are now. I think he wants to support Netanyahu, uh, keep him in office, uh, although there's a big move in Israel to get him out of office. Um, and he wants to um, he wants to retain control of of, of the situation there. Uh, therefore, uh, for political reasons, uh, Trump wants to support Israel. Ergo, Mike Johnson wants to support Israel. It's real simple. It is not a matter of moral equivalency. Well, we know what it takes to get some somebody elected. You have to say the right things at the right time and and have a track record. But sometimes the office does transform the philosophy and uh, the, the willpower of, of a Speaker of the House, where they, they, they shift, they change, they become their own man, so to speak, or their own woman. And um, the job shapes the individual. And one of the things I heard Mike Johnson say is that he is in support of bipartisan uh, relationships with the Democrats. Uh, I personally found that a somewhat optimistic uh, thing to hear. Uh, was it just... Uh, political banter? Was it just bombast? Or do you think there's an opportunity that uh, this new speaker will actually reach across the aisle and get some things done, which, by the way, would probably include Ukraine funding, because 
um, a majority of Republicans in the House and the Senate, uh, they do support Ukraine and support it quite well. Do you think that's an area where he'll be convinced, despite what Donald Trump wants? I don't know him. I don't know him well enough. Think any of us do. And I'll be reading the paper very ardently over the past uh, few days uh, or weeks um, to see where he really goes. But I think the jury's out on who owns him. We have a, you know, the continuing of the government funding coming up here. I believe it's around November the 9th, some part around that date. Uh, what's your prediction on uh, how successful this this new Speaker of the House we we all able to rally the GOP party to uh, be contributory to the successful passage of that funding bill, so the government doesn't shut down again. Yes, I, I think they, uh, Mike Johnson, and the Republicans will uh, will work toward funding. I think they may nevertheless um, require some of their ideology uh, to be included in conditions to the funding. We'll see some of that. It'll be negotiated as it, as it never was in the past. It never was. But we'll see some negotiation on ideological grounds. But I think ultimately there'll be a compromise. And I think we'll have our funding. We only have like, you know, three weeks to go before the middle of November when the deadline. Um, so, I, 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 But I think the biggest reason of all, Tim, is that over the past month, uh, if not before, the Republicans got too black eyes in the eyes of the public everybody so what what kind of clowns are these um that they should hold up on funding and put all these people um, you know out of out of their paychecks stop all government services what is this about um this is so destructive that no reasonable person on any side of the aisle could feel they were doing their jobs earning their pay being responsible to the electorate and the country um, so um, they come out of this month-long thing um, with two black eyes and Mike Johnson. They have no choice. If they want to retain any kind of support in the election of 2024, they got to get their act together right now. And if they fail to fund the government here in the middle of November, uh, they're going to lose a lot of votes, lots and tons of votes. It is very material. I, I think they realize they have a public relations nightmare because uh, his his closing remarks, he came out of the Capitol and went to the podium on the steps of the House of Representatives. And his closing remark is, uh, we have no time for celebrations or ceremony um, that normally accompanies the, you know, the mark of, of a new Speaker of the House. He said, we have no time for that. We are going to go back in and we are going to look at uh, funding for Israel and other things. So. Uh, I think you're right. Uh, they have two black eyes and they know it. And um, at least from the podium, Mike Johnson seems to recognize that and is willing to do something about it and uh, do it very quickly. So if nothing else, uh, we'll see where that goes. Yeah, but just remember that what he says, you know, the rhetoric he uses, the language he provides to us and to the media, okay, and try to get off on a good start. That's one thing. But let's see what he does. Not clear go. to me that, that he's going to you know, follow his own language. Not clear to me that he's not going to change his mind with a midnight call from you-know-who. Well, okay, let's go to you-know-who, because um, no matter what we do or what <laughs> we say, we always have you-know-who in the background. You-know-who is Donald Trump. Uh, to what degree does the, the landscape change as Donald Trump is um, in court and uh, his co-defendants are flipping on him. We have three attorneys who have flipped on him now. And uh, these are very close uh, allies of Donald Trump. And to what degree, if things start looking grim for Donald Trump, does that have any impact on the positions of the Speaker of the House or his fellow uh, Republicans? Uh, let's forget about the MAGA, the 20 MAGA Republicans, because they're gone. They're, they're beyond reproach. They're beyond hope of, of trying to convince them that, you know, America needs to move forward and not into chaos. The thoughts about um, details well, I mean, of Donald Trump's he's trial. The master, he's the master of chaos. And, um, you know, and some people really like chaos. They like the Bonnie and Clyde, uh, you know, kind of thing. They, 
they like um, uh, John Dillinger, an anti-hero person. So I think he's going to retain them, uh, whatever happens. Um, he may well be convicted on the basis of uh, some of these uh, people who have flipped and will testify against him. But remember, in a criminal proceeding, all you need is one. All you need is one, one sleeper juror um, to vote against conviction, and you beat it. And he, he's been uh, contaminating juries from the beginning all his, all his life. Um, he's been uh, you know, in, in, uh, intimidating them, threatening them, having his acolytes call them, make those midnight calls and all that. So the system is on trial. And query whether the system will hold up. There's nobody that we can think of who did more to damage the American jurist, jurist system, criminal justice system, than Donald Trump. So he's not finished with that. But the question really arises as to the press. You know, like everything else in the world, including the Middle East, it's what you say to the press and how soon you say it and how the press um, likes the raw meat that you feed them. Um, it's like animals in the zoo, honestly. They just want to have that raw meat. So the raw meat now is uh, he's, being, he's being completely obstreperous and he's not following the gag orders. And he got fined, uh, what did he get fined? Uh, $10,000 today uh, for a violation. Uh, in the, I guess it's in the civil case. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I don't know whether he has to pay that, uh, a check, maybe a credit card, maybe PayPal. I don't know how he pays that, but I hope he, he gets to pay it. And I hope everybody remembers it because he'll do it again. He likes to do it again, gets his name in the headlines. Um, and every time he does it, you know, it ought to be, and it ought to be, you know, collective between all of these cases. In other words, if he gets fined $10,000 in, in the civil case in New York, uh, the next judge who wishes to, uh, you know, hold him in contempt or punish him for violation of a gag order or to keep that in mind, um, the $10,000 may or may not have an effect on him. So let's make it 20. Let's make it 50. Let's make it a million. Let's make it 2 million to stop him. Apparently, he doesn't believe in that. So he doesn't, he doesn't well, abide by it. So I'm, I'm just ask, answering by saying I'm not sure whether people like the Bonnie and Clyde, you know, drama that's playing out in this reality show over his First Amendment rights. And, and the limitations, the guardrails from, um, you know, the gag orders, um, or whether they take it seriously. It's criminal. The whole thing shows you a, 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 a person who is morally bereft. Um, how does the country react to that? How does a guy like Mike Johnson react to that? Mike Johnson's a religious man. And I'm always interested in how the religious guys in this country, the religious factions, can forgive Trump for things that are obviously against the principles of their religion. Uh, let's see what happens when he lies. Let's see what happens when he violates every rule in a book. Um, let's see if Mike Johnson still likes him. Mm -hmm. Good point. You know, getting back to, you know, these, these pending fines or sanctions against Donald Trump, I'll introduce an acronym that I've used for years, and it pertains to Donald Trump perfectly, and that's the acronym is OPM, Other People's Money. Um, Donald Trump rarely spends his own money, and um, I'm sure there's a few legal defense funds that he's suckered the American public out of to fund, and I'm sure it comes right out of those those funds, those legal funds for Donald Trump and his efforts to right a wrong, which was the stealing of the 2020 election. So, um, yeah. but to get back to that, to get back to the 2022 election, midterm election. We know that the the platform of addressing and, and 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 stomping one's feet about how the 2020 election was stolen didn't play well. Uh, that tsunami of uh, red the red wave tsunami was a trickle as a direct result of people were not interested in addressing 2020 uh, election grievances that Donald Trump has brought to the forefront here today. In fact, in front of this selection of the House Speaker. That was the litmus test. And if you didn't believe in a 2020 steal, uh, then you would not get the endorsement of Donald Trump. In fact, just the opposite. You would be, uh, you would be thrown under the bus called a global uh, rhino or, or some other words. Uh, so that strategy didn't work in 2022, Jay. Why does Donald Trump, and I, I'm not asking you to get inside his mind because you may never get out, 
But why does Donald Trump think that's going to work now? Does work. Just because there wasn't a, a red wave doesn't mean he didn't have a big effect on that election. He should have gotten zero. He was a terrible, terrible president. Did nothing. And, and was arrogant and stupid the whole way through and appointed the wrong people and fired the wrong people. Um, terrible president. And, and I think he would have done much worse had he not engaged in the lies. And, and by the way, there are people out there, Tim, I don't want to surprise you in any way, who believe today um, that the insurrection of January 6th wasn't really an insurrection at all. It was just a protest. It was a Sunday outing, a picnic. And and um, they they truly believe that because that's in the Donald Trump playbook, so they're not outraged about it, um, and they weren't outraged in twenty two, in twenty twenty two about it. And if you talk to them today, they repeat the playbook. You know, I, I told you I had a conversation with some people who believe in the Second Amendment big time, and um, they got the playbook already, and they can defend the Second Amendment, the extension of the Second Amendment to everything including every case that comes to the Supreme Court, including every every gross shooting in a school, they can defend it because they got the playbook. And the same thing with, uh, you know, with January 6th. They got the playbook. And they believe in the playbook. So <clears throat> do not assume, uh, I think, do not assume that uh, uh, that they were all that, dis that the, the electorate was all that disappointed. I think um, some people were, disappointed and would not vote for him because of January 6th. But a lot of people uh, still believe in him. Well, last question before we uh, run out of time here, Jay, and that, um, you know, you recall it took 15 votes to get Kevin McCarthy installed as Speaker of the House. Uh, his downfall was he made a lot of deals that basically stripped his, his power away from him. Uh, that power play went right to the mega um, Freedom Caucus. And uh, he was doomed from the very moment he was brought in as Speaker of the House. Uh, I understand from what I read is that Mike Johnson doesn't have a lot of baggage. Uh, he's quite, you know, under the radar, quite unknown, not a lot of enemies in Congress. And the question is, do you think he had to make a deal with the devil and, and make all sort of concessions uh, just to become that Speaker of the House like uh, Kevin McCarthy had to do? Maybe not to the same degree, but I, to answer your question, I believe he had to make deals. You know, and what sticks in my brain is the comment that Matt Gates made, uh, where he's after Mike Johnson, you know, became speaker, was voted in as speaker. He said, well, you know, he's not the greatest speaker. He's not necessarily my first choice, but he's OK. And what that means to me is that for appearances sake, uh, he didn't want to. He didn't want to take a position that suggested that he'd made a deal with Johnson. Um, but I think it does suggest that. And I think the deal may be, may, you know, it may not be the same as a kind of uh, op open deal, um, overt kind of arrangement that resulted in McCarthy. But I think that there's a more covert deal that we're not going to hear about. Uh, they, were met, they were meeting in private. Uh, who's to say that uh, Matt Gates doesn't have some kind of deal with Johnson? Mm -hmm. uh, I think he had a swear fealty at some point to some degree, so he does have baggage. Okay, well, I guess time will tell on that. Um, what I hear you describe is that uh, Representative House Speaker Mike Johnson is the best, worst option. Um, I wouldn't go that far. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll leave it at that. Jay, do you have any final thoughts before um, we end the show here today? Well, it's another cliffhanger. We'll have to watch. It, it, it could be a better option than we had before. I don't think McCarthy was a good option at all. Um, and I, you know, and, and the bottom line is the country is in discord, the Congress is in discord, and the world sees this. And they are going to, and the, the, those who hate us, those who are our enemies, are going to take advantage. And the only way for us to deal with that, and it's it's kind of too late in many ways. Only way for us to deal with that is to get strong, get together, um, do public policy, do global um, presence, and, um, and, and be the country we always wanted to be. If we don't do that, I think we're on a major decline. All right. Uh, I'll leave a th my last thought on this one. It's, it's apparent that you have a minority caucus group called the Freedom Caucus. 
they're MAGA, they're loyal Trumpist. Uh, they won't think independently to their constituency or to the American public. Uh, they'll do what they're told to do and they'll be dutiful, loyal lackeys. And right now that group, that minority is the tail that wags the dog in the House of Representatives. They are in control of the House of Representatives and it's amazing how the GOP has allowed this to happen. So thank you, Jay. Amen, Fidel. amen to everything you said. Thank you, Jay. Thanks for coming on the show, Jay. And uh, I'm Tim Apicelli, your host for American Issues Take One. And why don't you join us next week? And until then, aloha. <laughs>